God's word to you and me is found in Matthew chapter 2, verses 1 through 12. Listen to the word of God. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, Where is the one who has been born King of the Jews? We saw a star when it rose and have come to worship him. When King Herod heard this, he was disturbed and all Jerusalem with him. When he had called together all the people's chief priests and teachers of the law, he asked them where the Messiah was to be born. In Bethlehem and Judea, they replied, for this is what the prophet has written. But you, Bethlehem, and the land of Judah are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For out of you will come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod called the Magi secretly and found out from them the exact time the star had appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search carefully for the child. As soon as you find him, report to me so that I may go and worship him. After they had heard the king, they went on their way, and the star they had seen when it rose went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were overjoyed. On coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. And then they opened their treasures and presented him with the gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their country by another route. May the Lord bless the reading of his word. Well, we made it into 2024. It's kind of sad that uh, Christmas is kind of over. Has everyone put their Christmas stuff? No, not everyone has put their stuff away. I'm almost there. I'm almost there. We still have some stuff up here where we're working on it. But Christmas isn't quite op- over yet because yesterday, those of you that know your high church dates, was Epiphany. And Epiphany on the Christian cal- calendar is the day that we celebrate the arrival of the wise men to present their gifts to Jesus. And the word Epiphany, which is in the Greek and the Latin means the appearing. And it means that this is the first time that Jesus appeared to those outside Israel and became known in the broader world. It's the day where the tradition of gift giving begins. The uh, wise men gave gifts to Jesus, and so we give gifts to each other. Um, Did you get some gifts at Christmas this year? Some? Is it okay? Is it all right? Okay, all right. It seems to me that as a nation, we've sort of toned down our spending at Christmas. At least that's what I've been reading in the papers, that we're not spending quite as much, but we're still buying gifts. And in that light, I want to share with you USA Today's review of the most sought-after gifts of December 2023. The number one most sought-after gift drum roll, the Barbie dream house, a pink plastic mansion where your Barbie doll can live and luxuriate and enjoy life. Now at the nine o'clock service, I, my wife was in the crowd. I said, do we even own a Barbie doll? And she says, yes, we do. Several. I'm sure the movie had nothing to do with this. Number two, We've got to include young men in this. I guess some girls would like this too. Is the, someone actually had bought this in the second service. The Nerf Pro Gelfire Mythic Blaster. This is a Nerf gun that fires gel bullets that explode on impact. They, they, will, they don't hurt you, but they, they make kind of a mess on the wall of your kitchen and a I, I don't think they'll hurt uh, a person, but they, they do kind of make a mess. Third is the MetaQuest 2, the virtual reality goggles that you take into the digital world. And these are, of course, Facebook came out with them. And you put these goggles on your face and you're able to enter into the digital world. Big seller. Number four, the Apple AirPods. Those are those little white things that you see hanging out of most of young people's ears, and they look like they're talking to nobody, but they are. And uh, that was number four. Number five, I've actually purchased. 
It's called an air tag. And what you do is you attach these to your keys, to your purse, to your luggage, and then when you lose them, you can look on your phone. If you lose your phone, you're completely lost. <laughs> but if you attach these to your keys, you can get on your phone and you can find them again. And I don't know why my kids gave these to me and my wife, but now we've got these babies on all our keys and all our... That's right, yeah, I turned 60, so that's it. So when you buy a gift for someone, it's, it's always more meaningful when the gift is bought with the person in mind that you're giving that gift to. If someone is, if, you know, if someone bought me, say, you know, I want pastor to have the number one gift on USA Today's review, and they bought me a Barbie dream house. It would mean nothing to me. I'd, I'd have to re-gift it to my granddaughter because I didn't watch the movie. I, I really don't care what Barbie's doing. But, so it, it wouldn't mean anything to me. And, and, but, but the most powerful gifts are the ones that connect with who that person is. I got this for you because I know who you are. I know what brings joy to your face. I know what you're interested in. I know your personality, and based on my knowledge of you, I went out and got this thing for you because I know that this will just bring you tremendous joy during the holiday. Now, the gifts that the three wise men presented to Jesus spoke to who they understood him to be. Um, this was a baby when who he grew up was going to change history. They knew this was not just any ordinary infant born into Judea. Um, this was a, 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 a human being who was going to matter, who was going to transform the world. And the three wise men or the magi understood that Jesus, the baby born in Bethlehem, was going to be the next king of Israel. They knew he was going to be the Messiah. So who were the magi and, and where did they come from and, and what prompted them to seek Jesus? Uh, the word magi is, is, uh, is sort of the base word where we get another word. You know what it is? Mag, magician. And these aren't the kind of magi who pull rabbits out of the hats or make things disappear. That's not the kind of uh, people they are. But it meant that they were men who studied wisdom in all its forms. They were astronomers. They watched the stars. They were they were watching to see what was God about in the universe and what was he going to do in the future. Um, they probably were immersed in ancient astrology. Um, they were called kings at times. We call them the three kings because they were wealthy. You don't get to travel like this and you don't offer these kinds of gifts unless you've got money and you've got position. Um, by tradition, it's, it's thought that we're told that they came from the east. By tradition, it's thought that these men were from either Persia or modern-day Iraq. So isn't it kind of funny? The first foreign visitors to Jesus were from Iraq and Iran. The Iranian wise men come and see Jesus. That's about what it would be today. Kind of interesting, isn't it? Uh, there's an old Persian custom that a star rises whenever a new king is born. That's customary that they believe this to be true in ancient Persia. But what is for sure is that they followed the star, which may have been a comet, and were led to Israel and eventually to the home of Mary and Joseph in Bethlehem. Now, contrary to the nativity scenes in our homes, I've got five of them in my house all put away nicely, of course, one out front and one in each bedroom so our kids don't forget what this holiday is really about. But um, they, they had three gifts, and we assume there's three magi, but there may have been two, there may have been ten. We just have, you know, frankincense, gold, and myrrh, three gifts, there must have been three guys, but that's not necessarily true. There could have been two, there could have been ten. And if they're important, wealthy guys, they probably have servants along with them. They probably have some guards because the roads were dangerous places to, to be on in those days. And so it, it may have been, there might have been 10 or 12 of them trudging along the road. We don't know. 
These were men who mattered and who had social standing. Herod verified the prophecy that Jesus the Messiah was to be born in, in Bethlehem. And of course, he slices, well, just tell me where, when you find him, let me know where he is. And of course, he had, he didn't want anyone challenging his throne. He was going to get rid of Jesus the Messiah when he found him. Um, he was an evil man. But when the Magi finally came to Bethlehem, the star rested over the house where Jesus was staying with Mary and Joseph. Now, Jesus was no longer in a stable. This also changes up our nativity scene a little bit. We're told in in Matthew chapter 2, he's in a house. And if you understand what Herod was saying after, after the wise men had left and Herod finds out that the baby's probably in Bethlehem, he says, kill every baby under the age of two. His assumption is that this baby is probably two years old. So he's not laying in a crib. This, Jesus may well have been a toddler. He may have been swinging from the chandeliers and getting into the cupboards and running around the house at this time. So he's a little bit older than that. So the Magi came to the house and they worshiped the baby Jesus. They honored Jesus and recognized his royalty And they gave him gifts that were befitting a king, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And after they had worshiped Jesus and gave him gifts, they went back to their country and they avoided Herod because they were warned about him. How were they warned about him? In a dream. Remember we talked about how dreams were so important with Joseph and Mary and knowing that Jesus was coming. And and, and so God works in dreams very much so. And I I think he still works in dreams today. The Magi are men who are shrouded in mystery. We have no idea how they found out about the arrival of the Messiah in Israel or that this particular star in the night sky would lead them to Jesus. We can only guess at the circumstances of this tremendous journey as far away from as Babylon or Persia. And it may be that they, it may be that as students or seekers of wisdom, they'd actually come into contact with the Old Testament scriptures. You remember what happened to Israel after, after Israel was conquered by Babylon? What happened to most of the population of Israel? Did they get to stay in Israel? No, no, they're, they're exiled. They're taken off to Babylon. They're taken off to Persia and And so the the, the, Jewish folks are spread out all over the Middle East. In fact, here's here's something that most people don't realize, but up until the 1990s, there were still Jewish strong populations in Tehran, in Iraq, in Jordan, and now there's none. They're all back in Israel, which should tell you about where we are on the prophetic time scale. But as even back here, there are Jewish populations in Babylon and in Persia. And so they would have the holy scriptures of Isaiah and Jeremiah. And so these wise men, these academics of the ancient world, they may have had access to these prophecies about the Messiah. And so they knew this was coming. And I f- firmly believe that these magi had a driving curiosity about the universe and the God who created it. They were interested in how God was at work in the world and the intensity of their desire to know how God was at work in the world was such that they were willing to travel far from home amidst danger, amidst uncertainty. And, and if, it, if you believe the commentaries and some of the writings about the Magi, they, some think it was a two-year trip. Can you imagine saying to your husband or wife, you know what? There's this religious pilgrimage that I've got to go on. I'll see you in 2027. How do you think your family would respond? That's a, are you out of your mind? What do you mean you're going to leave for two years and Back then, there's no cell phone. There's no trackers like I have on my keys. Um, you, you, can't, you can't find them. And, and so this is a huge commitment. And while they're out on the highways, Persia is not a safe place. It's not like Rome. Babylon's not like Rome. These are dangerous places to travel. 
And, and so they were putting it all on the line, and there was no guarantee that there was something at the end of the journey. I think that you and I can apply this kind of intensity in our own personal pursuit of knowing God and being a follower of Jesus. Listen to the words of Jeremiah 29, 13. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. God's desire is that we pursue him and that we draw near to him with all our hearts. And the promise is that when we do this, we'll not come up empty-handed. I believe that the God of the universe planted this desire to seek the Messiah in the hearts of the Magi themselves. We don't know if they were believers or not, but I know God is the, is the driving force behind everything that happened around Jesus and his coming into earth. And so I believe God himself is the one who planted that seed that these magi, these kings, needed to go to Israel to worship and pay homage to the new Messiah, the baby Jesus of Nazareth. God plants that desire to know him in the hearts of every human being. Even though we're born into a broken and sinful world, there is a desire to know the Creator. And I know this because we're built to be in fellowship with God. We're not complete until we are in fellowship with the God who made us through Jesus Christ. The call to pursue the Lord is still with us today. Psalm 14, 2 says this, the Lord looks down from heaven on all humanity to see if there are any who understand, any who seek God. The Lord is looking down on the earth to see, is there anyone who truly wants to pursue me, wants to know me? And he, he focuses on those who want to know him like a laser beam. And it doesn't matter where you live or how far away you are. If you desire to know him, he'll make sure that you find him. There's some crazy stories out there about people who live out in the middle of nowhere, nowhere near a church, nowhere near a missionary, and they desire to know the Lord, and God reaches them with a dream in, in the 21st century of all times. Or uh, the Word of God comes to them somehow, maybe physically. But the Lord, he, he pursues those who want to know him. In terms of our priority, you all know Matthew 6, Seek first the kingdom of God, and all these things will be added unto you as well. Seek first God's kingdom. Seek knowing him. Seek being a part of what he's about. We pr pursue God first by entering a into a relationship with him by believing in his son, Jesus Christ. We believe that he's the son of God, that he died on the cross for our sins and was raised again, and we agree to be his follower. We believe that Jesus is the one who matters, and, and we believe that he forgives us of our sin, all our sin and rebellion, and, we, and we, we accept him through prayer and dedicating our lives to him. Our pursuit of knowing God begins when we give our hearts to Jesus. The pursuit takes the form of several things, but number one, increasing our knowledge of him, his character, his work in the world that we live in, and his desire for our lives. In 2 Peter 3.18, we are called to grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. You've become a Christian. You've given your heart to him. Maybe you've been a Christian for a long time. What God wants you to do is to grow and mature in him, to become more like Christ. And one of the ways we do that is through our knowledge of Jesus and our knowledge of God. Those of you who've been married a little while, for your marriage to be good, you've got to get to know that man or woman that you promised to be with. You've got to spend time with them. You've got to find out what makes them tick. You've got to find out what makes them angry, what makes them happy, what brings them joy. If you can't discover these things, 
you're going to find that you're married to a stranger after 20 or 30 years. And so we have to be a student of that person that we married, don't we? Find out about them. Ask questions. Learn how they operate in the world that they are in. And you'll be a much happier married person. In terms of our life in Christ, we need to know his character, how he works in the world, how Jesus views the world, and what he desires of us. And as we learn these things and put them into practice, we grow closer to the Lord. And the Holy Spirit, which lives inside us once we accept him as Lord and Savior, opens our spiritual eyes so we can comprehend the actual word of God. And we have nature, which God reveals himself to us. You know, the, the stars in the sky, the mountains, the beautiful ocean. We see God in all that. But a specific revelation, his specific revealing himself to us is found right here. And that's why we need to be students of the Bible. As we worship, our hearts are aligned with his heart and we draw near to him. Remember that when the Magi found Jesus, the first thing they did, what did they do first before giving gifts? They worshiped. And we worship every Sunday. Why do we need to worship every Sunday? I remember one guy, I said, why don't you show up to church, brother? And he says, oh, I know what you do every Sunday. I don't need to go. I can just go once a quarter and I'll be good. And the thing about worship is it's... It, the, this illustration probably applies better to Pittsburgh. When I lived in Pittsburgh, we had potholes the size of the Grand Canyon. <laughs> Terrible roads. I love Pittsburgh, but the roads, not so much. I mean, you, and at the end of every winter, that, how many Pittsburghers here have been there? A few, yeah. You know, you got to get your, you got to get your tires aligned every year. <laughs> Otherwise, your car wants to do this, wants to go off the road. It won't go straight. And when we worship, it's like getting a spiritual alignment. We get things sorted out in our hearts and our minds so we can go down the road that God intended for us to go, so we can draw near to him. And Jesus and his calling on our lives must take priority over everything else. The Magi put everything on hold to, to seek him. We don't have to take a two-year pilgrimage or anything like that, we simply have to say, Lord, you're first in everything that I do and, and, and how I budget my time, how I budget my resources, and in terms of how I think, Lord, you have the first priority. You know, in this new year, how will you pursue the Lord in your everyday life? I want to encourage you, if you're not doing it already, just daily Bible reading. Just read it. And for me, one of the things I'm going to try and do or is I'm going to try and get back into memorizing Scripture. I think it was a lot easier when I was 16. I could in, in memorize whole chapters. I, I, it's going to be tough here at this time, but I'm going to do it. Uh, but, but I think it's so critical that we weave God's Word into our hearts and into His Spirit so when we think that those principles that we've woven into our hearts come out and we start seeing and thinking like Christ thinks and we start acting like he thinks as well. It's also a good advantage. keeps us from sinning, doesn't it? Remember? Remember what the psalmist said? Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not what? Sin against God. It's a preventative. So I want to encourage you, get into the Word of God this new year. Take time to pray. Talk to Him on a daily basis and worship Him so that your heart will be lined up with His heart. I began today's sermon talking about gifts, and I want to finish with the topic of gifts as well. The Magi gave valuable gifts to the Messiah to honor Him, as an act of worship. And if you're a believer, a follower of Jesus, then God has given you spiritual abilities and talents. Every person sitting here who belongs to the Lord, 
You've been given unique spiritual abilities and talents. Your personality is created by God uniquely. And you, each one of you, is uniquely suited to serve the Lord in some way. There's no one here who's useless to God. There's no one here who's just a spare part. That's simply not true. He's created each one of us for use in the kingdom of heaven. Examples of the spiritual gifts that God gives are in Romans 12 and 1 Corinthians 12. Just remember the number 12 and Romans and 1 Corinthians and you can find them. Some examples, spiritual leadership, service to others, evangelism, administration, teaching, hospitality. You're good at, at making stuff for our, for our church. You're, you're welcome people into your home. Some are good with music. Some are good prayer warriors. Some people tell me, well, I can't do anything. You know, I, I only sing two notes. I can't teach. I'm terrified of being in front of people. I don't have a lot of money to give the church. I don't know what I'm good for. I'm like, can you pray? Let me tell you, Prayer is one of the invisible things that is needed much more than anything else. If God's not with us, we're lost. And so prayer is so important. Some are encouragers. The person who comes along some, beside someone who everything has gone wrong and says, you know what, you're going to be okay. I'm going to walk with you through this. God hasn't forgotten you. That's a quiet, not very public gift, but boy, is it a, a needed and important one that we need all the time. Generosity, friendship. I was telling the earlier service, more kids in that one, but I'm like, you, I remember high school. You remember high, some of you remember high school? You have to think hard. There's always some kids sitting by themselves eating lunch every day all by themselves. And no one really cared that that person was all by themselves. And I, I remember going to college, of course, you know, Virginia Tech, 25,000 students. If you didn't make a plan to eat with somebody, you were going to eat, well, you're eating with 5,000 of your best friends, but n none of them you knew, and you're going to be by yourself. And then I go to places like I talk to people that live in these 55 and up communities or in places like the moorings, and guess what's happening? I'm eating by myself. I'm quite alone. We need people who will simply befriend other people. Just sit with somebody. We need people who have the gift of compassion. Can I help you with your problem? Can I come alongside and do what's needed? However God has put you together, take what you have, who you are, and offer it back to the Lord as an act of worship and as a gift to the Messiah. Some of you know, remember Romans 12, 1. I urge you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living and holy sacrifice acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of Worship. Worship. You're worshiping God by taking your talents, your personality, your abilities, your spiritual wiring and saying, God, here you are. Use me in what other, whatever way that you see fit. Serve the Lord as an act of worship in whatever capacity he reveals to you. And if you aren't certain, pray about it. Maybe God will give you a dream one night and say, do this. I don't know. More often than not, it's a, a friend coming along, a Christian brother or sister saying, you know, I think you'd be really good at this. I think you ought to try this. You say, no, I wouldn't. No, I wouldn't. They said, oh, yes, you should. And you try it and you find out, hey, that, that brother or sister in Christ, that was straight from the Lord. And may you be blessed this new year as you pursue knowing God and growing deeper with him. I pray that the Lord would put an intensity in your heart to know him better and to grow in your knowledge of him 
and of your service to him. Let's pray. God in heaven, I thank you for this example of the wise men, the, the magi who dropped everything to, to pursue you. I pray that we as your people today would do the same. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.